Let's get started. There's that. Not a whole lot in the way of major announcements, just don't forget homework two is due next Friday. Um, I know in concrete design we're sort of making sure that we, we give you all enough time, but in steel design we're actually doing pretty good on time. In fact, after today, there's a good there's a chance that you'll be able to finish homework two this, this weekend because um, uh, there's a couple things that are left over, but definitely after Monday. I mean you could already make a major dent in it right now. But uh, you got plenty of time. Okay. Today what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish that example that we did on staggered connections. Uh, and then we're gonna try and tie everything back to what I've got over here. Remember what we're ultimately trying to do with these series of lectures is look at the maximum capacity of a tension member. And so there are a series of limit states that will define what is the capacity of a tension member, namely its capacity under yielding in the gross section and under fracture in the net section. And so you can see where our discussion of net area and gross area tie into it because it's obviously a function of, uh, or the capacity is a function of those terms. What we haven't yet discussed are shear lag factors, those U terms. Um, we're talking about that today. And then there's one remaining check that we need to do on slenderness that we haven't discussed that I want to talk about today. Uh, and then we might be have enough time to do a full-blown example of attention member analysis start to finish. So we'll see where we get. Um, with that, let me go, to, <coughs> go back to our notes and let me go back a few slides. Maybe right here. Okay. So we have tension members, you know, they can fail under various different types of conditions, gross section yielding, net section fracture, all that. And so what we've been spending the last couple of lectures on is basically the section properties themselves, the areas that define what the capacity of a given section is, namely the net area, because um, that's the hard one. Um, the gross area is pretty straightforward. Now, for a bolted connect, for a welded connection, the net area and the gross area are the same. But for a bolted connection, um, there's a little bit more going on. Um, specifically, our generalized expression is the net area equals the gross area minus the area lost due to the presence of bolt holes along your net path, which is the uh, sum of the bolt diameter or bolt hole diameters times the thickness. And up here on the board, instead of d sub h, I just show dv plus an eighth of an inch. Because, I mean, that's the diameter of the hole. It's the diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch. And then there's the stagger factors, uh, which is the sum of S squared T over 4G. We add those for every appropriate diagonal failure path. Um, and remember, uh, what will, uh, so remember, what makes uh, net area challenging is that there are uh, multiple paths upon which failure is possible, so you have to check all of them. Uh, and I think that was clear after this example because we did, I mean, we had, you know, this failure path, we had that failure path, we had that failure path, and then we you know, went through all of them and found which one governed. That one was simple. Then we started looking at a rolled shape, an angle this time. We didn't quite finish it, but um, we, got, we got, you know, a, a good bit of the way there. Um, let me go back to our, our notes here. <coughs> so, we have an L7 by 4 by 5 eighths, um, so the area is 6 and a half square inches. We looked that up. We didn't compute it. And so, again, all the more reason to make sure you're bringing your turquoise blue AISC 15th edition steel construction. Um, uh, the, uh, the thickness of the plate or the lead uh, of, of the angle is 5 eighths. That just comes from the name. Uh, and then we started looking at our bolt holes. Um, the diameter of the bolts are 3 quarters of an inch, or the whole diameter is 7 eighths. So we have our area of the hole, which is just um, uh, 0.547 square inches. Okay. What we did over here uh, is we, we used our secret weapon of structural engineering, the samurai sword or the lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, and we said, okay, we're going to cut the leg of that one angle and sort of stack it up top to get an equivalent plate. And we do that so that we can determine gauge distances, sorry, so we can determine gauge distances for each of these associate paths. And so this gauge distance is going to be three inches, but the distance between this one and this one is, it ended up being 4.375. And that's what we did 
pretty much right at the end of the lecture on Monday. So is everybody okay with that? Any questions? Any comments? Well, I'd like to hear. Well, actually, no. I want to make sure you learn. So, like, I don't want you all asking questions. No, I do. You got questions? Please ask me one. Okay. So far, so good. So ultimately what this is going to look like, if I take this plate and I basically fold it up or cut that section and, and turn it out, is I'm going to have a plate that looks something like this. And so this is sort of where that red dash line is going to be. And I'm going to have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. And in this diagram, so maybe I'll do that so we know what we're going off of. I've got these distances, and I've got this distance right here that I'm trying to figure out. Maybe I'll set to replicate this. Right with me? Okay, so again, this is taking that leg and just stacking it up top. So that red dashed line is where I slice that and stack it up top. So this dimension here is going to be the, the, the three inches. And this dimension is the 4.375 inches. This right here is two inches. Remember, in this connection, the main body of the member is all the way over here on the right. So the lead line are these bolts, not these. These are the lead line bolts. So basically what I've got is this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D, this is E. And so I'm sort of looking at this type of stuff right there. That, that's what I'm looking at. In fact, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and scooch it over a bit. So we have the gross area of 6.50 square inches, a thickness of 5 eighths of an inch, and we have a whole area of 0.547 square inches. With these paths and with this connection configuration, how many net area paths do you see that are worth checking for this connection? How many? So can we take time on this? This is important. Okay, well, let's look at it this way. You want to name one? Name a path for me. A, B, D, E. A, B, D, E. That is correct. That is a path. How about another one? Somebody else? A, B, C, D, E. There we go. Any others? I promise I'm not ask, I don't ask trick questions and stuff like this, so it's okay to tell me no or yes or whatever. Be confident. A D. 
A what? A to E. Well, that's what this, what this one is, right? A, B, D, E. There aren't any other, are there any paths that don't go through the lead line or that go through the lead line? I guess is it, right? There's just these two. So let's do each one of them. So help me out. How would you determine the net area of A, B, D, E? How would you do that? I'm asking you. Somebody that didn't say something just now. Let's. Bless you. Mr. Moran. A, B, D, E. So we take the gross area. We subtract how many bolt holes for path A, B, D, E? There we go. All right. So, this page, do we add any stagger factors for this path? No, you do not. And so that's it. So, that's our formula. So we have 6.50 square inches minus 2 times 0 0.547 square inches. We get what? So we'll call it maybe 5.41. Do we have a second on that value? Yes. So that's the net area for that path. So this one is 5.41. All right. Now, let's talk about the net area for A, B, C, D, E. So we take the gross area, and help me out, we subtract the area lost due to the presence of bolt holes. How many bolt holes are we subtracting, Mr. Seth? Three. Three. Exactly right. How many stagger factors are we adding? Two. Two. Can you tell us something about those stagger factors? Stagger factors. Um, so what's the formula for a stagger factor? It would be S squared T over 4G. Okay, S squared T over 4G. And so look at that formula and tell me the, what, what's the deal. S, S, would be, S would be different for... Hold on, is it... Okay, so you're, you're, stumbling, you're, you're, you're on the right track. They're not the same stagger factor. G would be different, my bad. Exactly right. They're the same S value, but the Gs are different. So there's two different stagger factors. Does that make sense? So you can't, you can't just calculate one stagger factor and... Uh, 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 and multiply it by two. So our formula is going to be like plus maybe one stagger factor plus another stagger factor. They're going to be different, okay? Because we have 6.5 minus 3 times 0 0.547 plus S squared over, S squared T over 4G for one and S squared T over 4G for another. Now, what is S for, for these stagger factors going to be? Two inches. Two inches. So it's two inches times the thickness. So two inches, sorry, two inches squared times the thickness over four times. And what are our two gauge values? 4.375 and 3. There you go. So 4 times 4.375 plus S squared 5 eighths over 4 times 3 inches.
have a number for me? Which one do we use? The bottom. the bottom one. The one, because if I'm going to yank on this and it's going to fracture, it's going to fracture along the path that offers the least resistance. In this case, the path with the least area. Net area is 5.21 square inches. Questions on that? I mean, please, this is this is the time. Now, why exactly did you use two stair factors with because of the stacking? Because because when we uh, did our surgery and cut the plate and put it on top, that resulted in well, first off, we have two diagonal paths, so we've got to use two stagger factors regardless. But they're not the same because while S is the same, G is not. You have to compute one and then the other. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a little confused on which side you take this for your lead line. Okay. So the short answer is the one that's closest to this. Okay. The long answer is imagine, look at this as if it was one big long tension member, right? So here's, let's draw right here. Here's your tension member, right? And so what we're looking at right now is just, that, the small piece on the end and that small piece on the end. And so the lead line is sort of, imagine that I've got like a, you know, like a rubber band and I'm stretching it this way. Whichever bolts that it hits, namely that one, that one, and that one, those are the lead line. Same thing over here. The ones over here, those are the lead line. And so when you look at your connection diagram, a short way of looking at it is, we call this a break line. Whichever ones are closest to the break line, those are your lead lines. So all the ones over here. So in other words, you wouldn't like you wouldn't consider that failure path because it would eliminate these bolts which are on the lead line. But I mean, I'll, this is this is why we're here. So please, if those questions come on, this is I welcome them. So. Yes, sir. How do you keep the two A in separate? Like there's an A in up top that's 0.54, but then we just put one at the bottom. It's 5.21. You're talking about that? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. That is not a N. That's an H. Okay. So, if you want, um, you can write areas of hole. Okay. I have to make sure and say areas of hole and not a hole because... Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I knew it was coming at one point, so I might as well just get it out of the way. But I have no problem if you put that on your homework. I really don't. If you, were, you could... I wrote a hole all over my homework and my professor didn't mind. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Would this problem be any different if the bolt layout was like part of the middle row stuck out further than like the top two? Yeah, it would. Because then, uh, well... But like if, it, if like the... It would, it would because... So if you just mirrored this to where that was going out like that, your calculation of the paths of this path would be the same. But then you would also have that path to consider. You see what I mean? So you'd have that, that, and then that. So you'd have you'd have more paths. But if it was mirrored, then that last one would be good. Does that make sense? This is good stuff. Everybody, everybody else, see with that? I like this. This is good stuff. Again, any other questions? All right, now, remember, here's what we're after. The capacity of a, of a member according to gross section yielding or net section fracture. 
And in net section fracture, there's two problems. The net area and this thing, U. This, this U-term. What is going on with this U-term? This U-term stands for what's called a shear lag factor. Okay? Let me explain what a shear lag factor is. Okay? When you all took Engineering 216, you said, okay, here's a tension member in my hand, right here, tension member. Take it and I yank on it. Okay? Samurai sword or lightsaber through the section. What is the stress? P over A, right? Nothing wrong with that. Except it, it does sort of ignore a little bit of reality that goes on when you look at, at how members are really connected to one another. Like, let's take this image here. This image is a, a typical connection scenario in steel structures. I have a wide flange section and I have bolts going through the flange. But notice how I don't have bolts going through the web. Okay? That's very common for how to connect uh, steel elements from one member to another. Okay? So not all of the components of that cross section are connected. The flanges are connected, but the web isn't. Okay? So as a result, if I'm over here, like let's say I grab a hold of these plates and I'm yanking the plates that these are connected to, it takes a little while for those stresses to propagate from the flange and into the web. When I samurai sword or lightsaber out here in the middle of the member, sure, stress is P over A. But out there at the connection, the stresses are a little wonky. They're a little uniform or un non uniform. If you look at the, um, the, uh, the uh, like a, a 3D or a, a, a complex funded element analysis looking at the stresses around the connection region for a tension member, they're weird. They're all over the place. See, it takes a little while for the stresses to catch up, right? So the idea is, here's sort of the way I describe it. Let's say I have an angle, right? So here's the angle, right? But let's say I've only bolted this leg and this leg is not. Well, when it gets yanked on, this leg is getting yanked, but this one isn't, right? So it takes a little while for that stress to propagate through the section. So part of the section is lagging behind, hence why we call the term shear lag, because some of the members being yanked on and some of it isn't. So it's kind of undergoing that shear effect and, and it's, it's lagging high. In the gross section out here in the main body of the member, we don't care about that. We don't have to worry about non-uniform stress distribution because out here in the main body of the member, it's pretty uniform. Problem is we're not looking right now at, at gross section. We're looking at the net section. We're looking right here or right here. And that's all sorts of messed up, right? So unfortunately, we can't ignore the fact that the stresses along the net section are not pretty. They're not uniform. Okay? We have to deal with that. This is steel design. This isn't you know, structural analysis where we can make some rules. No, we need to deal with these real phenomena that affect uh, the behavior. And these are where empirical expressions come from. Now, what I want you to do, break out your AISC 15th edition steel construction unit. I want you to turn to 16.1-30, because I know everybody in here brought their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual. Okay. Now, I'll wait a second for a second there. This is in the way back of the manual. This is not in the front. This is going to be like... Back near, back near, like right, right in there. So you, okay, you're you're getting there. So, what's the first thing that you should notice on my slide? Okay. A green star, which means you ought to put a tab in your manual there because we are going to be referring to this table a fair amount. This is the table that we will use to look up shear lag factors. I'm going to give everybody a second to get there. And I see some folks already breaking up their tabs in there. Mm -hmm. All right, we're getting there. Good. All right, now, remember, shear lag factors are a function of the cross-section and how it's being connected. Remember this. 
This is a cross section where the flanges are connected, but the web isn't. Okay? So, I would like somebody to do me a favor. And if you notice in that table, there are a series of cases. I would like you to read, somebody, to read case one. Ms. Roberts. All tension members where the tension load is transmitted directly to each of the cross-sectional elements by fasteners or welds. Awesome. So what that is saying is when the tension load is transmitted to all of the cross-sectional elements by, by fasteners or welds. And if that is the case, what is our U value? One. So, for example, what would the shear lag factor be for this case? One. Because this cross-section has two components. That lead, that lead. And both legs are connected by fasteners or welds. They're both got bolts to them. What about this? What's you, what would you be for that case? What's the cross-section? Just a plate. Does that plate have bolts or welds through it? So what's you? One. Now. What about that case? Would you be one here? No. no. Because I have the uh, flanges connected, but not the web. Now, let me go forward a little bit. Now, what about section or case two? I'll, I'll read that one out. All tension members, except HSS, HSX, the HSS stands for hollow structural sections. Basically, tubes, like rectangular tubes, uh, circular tubes, things like that, square tubes. All tension uh, members where the tension load is transmitted to some, but not all, of the cross sectional elements by longitudinal welds, or by fasteners, or by welds, or so on and so forth. Okay. So, case one is where they're all connected, case two is where only some of them are connected. Now, obviously, you can't have a case where none of them are connected because if the tension member isn't connected to anything, it's just sitting there. You know, it's got to be connected to something. So, it's either all or some. Now, if it's some, if we are in case two, what is our formula? It's 1 minus x bar over L. I wrote that here, and I wrote it a little differently. Um, I wrote x bar sub con and L sub con. Okay? And we're going to explain what each of those terms mean in very significant detail here in a little bit. But the one other point I want to mention with this table is that multiple cases may apply. For instance, if you read here, alternatively, case 7 is permitted for W sections. For angles, case 8 is permitted to be used. And when you are dealing with a section, it is possible that multiple cases may apply. Okay? So whenever you're doing a problem, you need to kind of look at this table, and you need to see, okay, Probably going to be either case one or case two, but it might be more than case two. It might be case two and case seven, or case two and case eight. The remaining cases are ones where, are really ones that primarily deal with welds. So we've got uh, case three with welds, and case uh, four with plates, and what are called a balanced weld connection. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, just recognize that it's probably either case one or case two, but that also multiple cases may apply. Don't worry, we're gonna have some problems looking at that. So on so far, or so far so good? Alright, let's look at case two. Now I have this written a little differently than how it's listed in the table, and I do that because I want to make sure that you understand what those terms mean, what the X bar means and what the L means. Okay? And I have it written that way because they are related to the connection. L sub C O N is just the connection length. And I'll help you, I've got some images that will show what that means here in a second. The connection eccentricity is X bar. And that's defined as the distance from the connected face to the centroid. Okay? And so, 99 times out of 100, the X bar is something that you look up. But, you need to make sure that you're looking up the right number. In other words, if you just go to the table and pull out the X bar, there is a chance it's the wrong number, okay? 
because it's got to be the right number that corresponds to the right connection. So far so good? Okay. So here's some examples of connection eccentricity. Okay. Let's look at, at some cases. Let's look at this one here on the bottom. So this one here on the bottom is a very common tension member. You have a problem like this, I believe, on your homework assignment. It is a channel, a C-shape, and it's connected via the web. There are bolts going through the web. So this would obviously be a case two scenario because the bolts are going through the web, but not the flanges. Okay. And the connection, eccentricity, is the distance from the connected face to the centroid. And the centroid of a channel is about right there. So what you're looking for is that distance. Okay? Now I want everybody to open up table 1.5 or 1-5. That's in the way front of the book. I want to make a point on this. Take your time. We're in a hurry. I mean, this, this is important stuff. Take your time. So it's on page 1-38. Okay, so let's say we're looking at a C 6 by 13. A C 6 by 13. Okay? Now, if you've got a C6 by 13, and let's say the bolts are connected via the web, or the, it's, the bolts are going through the web, the connection eccentricity would be the distance from the back of the web, the connected face, to the centroid. Now, I want you to look at that image up there on the top left. Okay? And that image on the top left will show you a connection diagram, and, it, and those terms that are in the table are reflected down below. And you should see X bar going from the connected face to the centroid. Now you might see an XP term. I'll show you, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. For now, ignore the XP stuff. Um, does everybody see what we're talking about? So what is the X bar, the connection eccentricity for a C6 by 13? I'm asking. Believe me, I don't remember that number. Say that again? 0.514. 0.514. Does everybody else find that? Or do I have a second on that? So when you're do, if you have a problem, a C6 by 13 connected through the um, through the uh, web, this term would be 0.514. Make sense? Now, turn forward a few pages to the angles, to page or to table 1-7. Now with the angles, you have X bar terms. But you also have Y bar terms. Okay? So which one do you use? Well, it depends. If the bolts are going through the long leg, you would use X bar. If the bolts are going through the short leg, you use Y bar. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, what if the legs are equal? Like, what if it's an L6 by 6? What can you tell me about the X bar and the Y bar? Should be the same. They are, exactly. They should be the same, and they are the same, so it doesn't really matter. Now, um, one thing I'll say, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, actually, actually, no, no I'll, I'll just say it. In that table for the angles, and it's particularly pernicious with the angles, but do you see how there's an X sub P and a Y sub P? Ignore that. Okay? Here's why you should ignore it. Um, that term will become relevant near the end of the semester when we look at beams. But suffice it to say that X sub P is sort of the, the uh, well, it's a term that's definitely related to a section's bending capacity. Uh, it's basically a, a location of a different type of neutral axis. I don't really want to get into it now because I don't want to obfuscate things when we're trying to 
um, trying to just deal with the basics. But believe me, we will cover it later, so, so don't worry. But for now, just, just uh, ignore the X and P and make sure that you're looking up either the X bar or the Y bar. Yes, sir? So the X bar was for the short leg? Was it the no, no, that's for the long leg. Yeah. That's, and see, look up top. Look at the image. You should see that from the long leg to the centroid is measured as X bar. That's, and that's why we're doing this in here. That's exactly why. Yeah. Everybody good with this? All right. Now, I'm going to confuse you, and I apologize. Whenever you're dealing with this situation, this one's a little special. This one's a little unique. So, let's say you have a W section connected via the flanges. If that is the case, what we do as analysts is we basically make an assumption that half the load goes to half the section and half goes to the other. In other words, if I have a W section connected by the flanges and I'm yanking on it, we say half the load goes up here and half the load goes down here. So when we're looking up X bar connections for a W section, we actually look up the centroid for an equivalent WT. So in other words, let's say I have for a W 12 by 30, the X bar connection would end up being the Y bar for a WT 6 by 15. Let me explain. So first off, we assume that half the load goes above and half the load goes below. Now remember, let's take a W of 12 by 30. Remind me, what does the 12 mean? Not the flange width. What's for a W 12 by 30? You're close. What's that? Base, it's about how deep it is. The 12 is about how deep it is, and what's the 30? Oh, breaking my heart. Pounds per foot, that's how heavy it is, right? So if I were to take that W section and I were to slice it into a WT, would you agree it would be about half as deep and it would weigh half as much, right? So an equivalent WT, if I was looking at a W12 by 30, an equivalent WT would be a WT6 by 15. Make sense? Now, turn forward a little bit more to table 1-8, and I want everybody to look up WT6 by 15. If you have a WT 6 by 15, what's the Y bar? 1.27. 1.27. Now, what, now, look at your image on the top left. That goes from the top of the section, the connected face, to the centroid. So if you had a W 12 by 30 connected by the flanges, the X bar connection would be the Y bar for a WT 6 by 15, which is 1.27 inches. I know that was weird. I know. But these are empirical relationships. Okay? So sometimes the rules can be a little funky. That happens. But again, the idea is, you know, if you're yanking on that member that, that half the load goes above, half the load goes below. Sound good? Before I move on, any questions about X bar? Because I want to talk about the length here in a second. Now look, here's the formula. 1 minus X bar over L. So I want you to tell me, look at this formula over here, and I want you to answer me. If L gets bigger, what happens to you? Does you get bigger or does you get smaller? It's bigger, right? 
because that fraction gets smaller, but you're taking one minus that fraction, right? So the longer the length, the bigger u is, okay? Now that makes sense when you look at the theory, okay? Here's a tension member and here's a connection, right? So I samurai sword or lightsaber through the lead line, and remember, what we're trying to figure out is how much of that section is effective in resisting those loads there because those stresses have to propagate, they gotta catch up. Well, with a longer connection, there's more room for those stresses to propagate. So over here, maybe only this much section is effective, but as the connection gets longer, more of that section is able to resist that load. So as the connection length increases, the usable area should increase, right? Because that's what you're doing. You're taking the net area and you're adjusting it by the shear lag factor. So the more area that's usable, the shear lag factor should go up. And so that's what the, the length of the connection does. The length of the connection goes up, that goes up. So does that make sense from a theoretical standpoint? The only other, I think, quirk is what if you have a staggered connection or, or how do you actually compute it? Connection length is taken as the out-to-out -out distance from your extreme bolts, from the bolt on one end, the bolt on the other. So if, again, if you have a, a, a bolted connection from this extreme bolt to that extreme bolt along your, your, your force of tension. Notice how you don't account for that. That's not in your connection line. From out to out bolt. So if this is your connection, that's the deal. That's your connection, that's the deal. If it's rectangular, like a parallel grid pattern, just out to out. Any questions? If you're looking at a welded connection, uh, this isn't going to matter right now. We'll deal with welded stuff later. But if you're dealing with a welded connection, the connection length is just the length of your, your weld along the member. And if you have a weld like this, which we will talk about welds like that later, it's the average length. So if this is 8 inches and this is 4 inches, that's 6 inches. So it's just the average. And we will deal with, we will design welds like that near uh, week 6 or 7. Uh, it's called a balanced connection, and you can configure it like that to eliminate your moment. So that's that's why you do that. Okay. So far, so good? All right. One last thing to talk about, and then we're going to call it. I want to talk about slenderness. So I want everybody to turn to 16.1-28. Uh, so I'm taking you back to the guts of the manual near the uh, uh, near the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the shear light table. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting is I want you to check slenderness in this class. And you're like, but Dr. Mike, read section D.1. What is the first sentence in D.1? There is no slenderness limit for tension members in tension. So why do that? Well, read the user note. Read the user note for me. Remember design on the basis of tension. The slenderness ratio L over R preferably should not exceed 300. This suggest, suggestion does not apply to rods or hangers in tension. Okay, so later on we'll discuss threaded rod design and we'll ignore the slenderness check. But it says for members designed on tension, it should preferably not exceed 300. So why? Okay. L over R, which is the, 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 um, a measure of slenderness, Basically what L over R is, is a mathematical expression of the ratio of how long something is to how big a round it is. And so R being a radius of gyration is a way of measuring how big a round something is. And so a Coke can, for instance, has a much lower slenderness measure than a drinking straw. Because a drinking straw is much longer versus how big a round it is. Make sense? So L over R for a drinking straw is much higher than L over R for a soda can. So why do we want an L over R less than 300 for a tension member? Well, anybody that's ever done any steel fabrication, or if you're ever on a construction site, if you ever see a, a steel member that has an L over R larger than 300, they are really difficult to handle. I mean, you'd be surprised how when you pick up a piece of steel that has an L over R greater than 300, how it acts 
like it has about as much stiffness as a piece of wet spaghetti because it gets really floppy and really hard to, uh, to manage. Um, members with excessive slenderness can have excessive sag, they can vibrate a lot, they can be tough to erect, you can get damaged during shipping. And so this isn't a limit that is intended for strength. This is a service check. This is a check to ensure the structure's day-to-day -day performance and to ensure its performance other, uh, uh, other than construction. So I, and pretty much the most structural engineers, will enforce the L over R uh, 300 limit because of that very reason. Now, L over R, okay? L over R is the member length. R is the radius of gyration. Now, one thing I'll tell you is to pay attention to units because member lengths, you usually say members are like 20 foot long, 25 foot long, but radii of gyration are in inches. So don't take a member length in feet and divide it by a radius of gyration in inches, okay? The units have to be copacetic. Okay, so make sure your member length is in inches. Number two, what is the radius of gyration? Remember, this is from mechanics or statics or whenever you took it, the radius of gyration is the square root of I over A. Okay, that's how it's defined. The moment of inertia divided by the cross-sectional area. So, I want you to turn, I know I'm getting used to it, we're going to do a lot here. I want you to turn back to the, to the table with all the properties. Show me, the, let's go to the wide plane sections. The 1-1, one one, the W shapes. It doesn't really matter any one of them. All right. Now, notice how the left page gives you the, the flange width, the web thickness, all that stuff. But then the page on the right gives you the x-axis properties, the y-axis properties, the torsional properties, all that stuff. Now, if you look at the x-axis and the y-axis, they have different R values, an R value for the X axis and an R value for the Y axis. I don't pick a W shape, it doesn't matter, pick one. Which is smaller, the X axis or the Y axis? The Y axis. The Y axis. For W shapes, the Y axis is always smaller, okay? Um, if you look at the moments of inertia for an I shape, the IX and the IY, which is smaller, IX or IY for any random shape. IY. IY. If you look at an I beam, I beams are easier to bend like this way than they are this way. I'll bring my my uh, rubber I beam mock up next time so to, so y'all can see that. So much so that we tend to refer to the Y axis for I beams as the weak axis. And so for W shapes, RY is always smaller, okay? Now here's the kicker. Go to the angles, table 1-7. Now, which one is the smallest for an angle? Is it RX? Or is it R Y? It's actually a trick question because it's neither. It's R Z. Look over on the very, very right. See, angles are unsymmetric sections. See, a W shape has an axis of symmetry about this way or that way. Angles do not. Okay? And as a result, angles have a principal axis. It's kind of like Moore's circle where you had a principal direction. So angles actually report an entirely different axis called RZ. RZ is the worst case scenario. Think about it like this. If I have a really, really slender angle, it's going to buckle whichever way it wants to buckle. And because angles are unsymmetric, they're not going to buckle like about their y-axis or about their x-axis. They're kind of going to buckle kind of slantwise. 
And so that kind of slantwise is the Z axis about which they want to buckle. So for angles, you'll look up the RZ quantity, okay? Because that's the smallest one of all three. That's that's the purpose there. That makes sense. Okay. So here's how I want to close it. I put in the slides on slide 114 the summary of all the equations we've developed so far. Here's gross section yielding, net section fracture. Here's where you can find the U values. Here's our net area for bolted connections. Here's our shear lag factor for case two. Here's our slenderness limit. And we're going to add to this stuff later when we develop some expressions for design, some block shear rupture equations, and threaded rods. When we come back on Monday, we do a full blown tension member exam, start to finish, um, to look at its full capacity. Once we have determined that, the next thing we'll ask is, how do we design? Okay? And we, you know, it's like we're in steel design, maybe we ought to design something. Um, that's all I've got, everybody. You have a very wonderful weekend. I'll see you on Monday.